I'm really pleased to have with us um, Anne Beatty from uh, Kroger, who's the Senior Strategy Manager. And I'm really excited to have you here. Um, I've, I've seen some of the slides because you shared them initially. Very exciting. Um, I'm going to sit back and relax and I'll talk to you in about 20, 25 minutes. <laughs> Great. Thank you for uh, having me and uh, excited to be here today and, and talk to everyone. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I have a few slides to go through and then we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, so we're going to talk about how plant-based products are changing the supermarket landscape today. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself a little bit. So um, Ann Beatty, I am a, the e-commerce senior strategy manager at Kroger. So I work with a team of people to help drive Kroger's e-commerce strategy. Um, and maybe everyone knows this, but just in case you don't, Kroger is actually America's largest uh, pure grocer. Uh, so we sell more groceries than um, anyone except Walmart, really. Uh, so we have about 2,700 stores across the United States and um, are now ranked in the top 10 of e-commerce retailers in the United States. So uh, very exciting to, to get to help shape our future e-commerce strategy. Some of my background uh, is in consulting, working for our analytics subsidiary called 8451. And then I also have several years of merchandising experience at uh, Target. And then I'm one of the co-chairs of a, an internal group at Kroger that focuses on wellness and plant-based eating for, uh, for our associates to help support their health. And I also um, consider myself a, a plant-based advocate in the corporate world. So I'm, even though it's outside of my day-to-day -day responsibilities at Kroger, I definitely like to help advance the agenda of uh, plant-based eating and kind of lean in and consult here and there whenever uh, the topic comes up. So like I said, we're going to talk about how plant-based products are changing price positioning and the supermarket landscape. I'm going to keep things fairly high level, but uh, feel free to ask any, any questions that you might have at the end, and I'll do my best to, to answer them without uh, oversharing, of course. Um, so I was glad to see the PBFA participating because I, I do like to borrow their materials here and there. We have a great relationship with the PBFA. They're a fantastic uh, partner, and we've done some tests together in store, which is really exciting. But um, you guys probably know that plant-based foods are definitely continuing to grow. And uh, what's exciting is that the amount of categories that they're growing in has just exploded. So whereas a few years ago, it was all about milk, things have really expanded into all sorts of new categories. Um, meat obviously is uh, at the top of the, the headlines a lot and we're seeing a lot about different exciting new meat uh, items that are coming out. But things like cheese has become surprisingly popular um, in the last few years. And then eggs have actually seen the greatest growth uh, in the past year. So really uh, exciting to see that it's touching several more categories in the store. Also makes it more complicated to merchandise. So we'll, we'll touch on that. But um, it's definitely more than just kind of almond milk and veggie burgers uh, nowadays. Uh, so the plant-based shopper is kind of unique among the different uh, category shoppers that we would have at the, in grocery. In general, they are higher income, they're younger, they tend to have young children. Um, they're very interested in shopping online. They're not afraid to try new things. They're, they're actually interested in trying new things. And most interestingly, uh, the majority of them are not actually vegan or vegetarian. So they purchase plant-based products in moderation, but they also purchase meat and regular dairy products. So they really kind of cross the spectrum of vegan, vegetarian, and the biggest group are actually what we would call flexitarians. Um, so it's kind of dispelling the myth that it's a bunch of, um, you know, vegans looking for tofu. It, it really touches uh, the entire 
market, which is exciting. Um, and really important for retailers, uh, these shoppers tend to spend more overall at the store uh, in, their, in their basket. So it kind of makes sense. They tend to be higher income. They're not as price sensitive and they're interested in new things. They're going to be more likely to add things to their basket. So this really makes the plant-based shopper super valuable uh, to retailers, which also plays into a lot of the merchandising decisions, of course. And then there are several different reasons why customers try plant-based foods or why they continue to engage with them. I think here again, 10 or 20 years ago, it would be more focused on things like environmentalism, sustainability, or animal welfare. And while those are still important to a lot of people, the vast majority of people who purchase these items do so because of a perceived health benefit or just because it tastes good. I know lots of people who are not remotely vegan who just enjoy almond milk and uh, they're, you know, they think they're getting a health benefit from it as well. It's just a bonus. Um, but I think it's interesting to keep in mind that the health perception and just the general taste of positive taste are kind of new reasons for shopping these categories, particularly when you think about how, again, the perception several years ago would be that you're sacrificing taste by eating this way. That's not the case at all anymore. And I think customers understand that uh, these plant-based items can be just as tasty, if not even better than the um, conventional alternative. And then maybe you guys have all seen, but plant-based eating has actually risen even more during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's a variety of factors at play here. Um, you know, there was a spike in meat prices during the pandemic. There were several different shortages that happened that can drive people to try new things that maybe they wouldn't have before. There's also a focus on um, the role that animal agriculture may, may or may not have played in the pandemic and could play in future pandemics. And so there's a, a movement around eating a more plant-based diet can help prevent that from happening again. There's also a lot of customers that are more interested in wellness than ever before and boosting immunity and taking care of themselves to prevent becoming sick with an illness like this. Um, I think we all know that there are complicating factors that made COVID-19 even worse for some people, things like heart disease and diabetes, which can all be prevented as part of a plant-based diet. So I think several factors combined to make 2020 um, an even, even stronger year of growth for plant-based foods, which you know was not something that any of us were anticipating, but very exciting to see. And then it's also really a new frontier when you're seeing the level of private label engagement in plant-based foods that we're seeing today. So Again, as a vegan personally, and having worked for the Kroger family of companies for almost eight years now, I never thought I would see this many plant-based private label products at a mainstream grocer like Kroger. So it's incredibly exciting and it's definitely a sign of the times when you think about the investment required for the company to develop new items. Um, launching more than 75 new Simple Truth plant-based products in 2020 is enormous uh, and definitely customers are responding. It also is part of the overall movement towards making plant-based items more affordable. These being private label, um, they are generally going to be more affordable than their national brand counterpart. Um, certainly they're going to be at parity, if not less, less expensive. So it's making the items more accessible. Um, it also, is a really obvious part of you know helping a retailer like Kroger meet customers where they are and stay on top of customer trends. Um, you know we are a mainstream grocer, so we are we know that we're not Whole Foods. We, we know that we're not Trader Joe's, but we want to have the products that appeal to uh, the the vast majority of shoppers. And um, it's very exciting to see some of the product development that uh, we've been able to do in the last couple of years. And from everything I'm hearing is that the products are, 
are doing fantastic and um, there's you know even more development coming uh, down the road. This does lead though to challenges of where to put all of these new products um, in the store. So we all know that shelf space is limited and it's at a premium that creates an issue of if we have all of these new products coming to market, these meat replacements, cheese, eggs, dairy replacements, you know, where should we put them in the store? Uh, the issue of finding the space is there, but then there's also the issue or the question of, you know, where does the customer expect to see these products? Where does the customer look for these products? It has flip-flopped in the last few years, and I think you'll even continue to see it evolve because I don't know that we've 100% landed on the right answer, but we were able to do an in-store test that uh, for the first time really definitively pointed to uh, the sales impact of moving items out of kind of a special section and into their sort of home location. So previously in Kroger stores, there was a, a vegan or vegetarian section. So this is where you would find the tofu, the plant-based cheese, the plant-based meat, all of those specialty items would be together in one little four foot section, generally four feet. Um, as the variety continued to explode, obviously the, it's not all going to fit in that section. And also as the products go mainstream, a lot of customers, if they're not vegan, are not aware of this special section in the store and they wouldn't have the first clue on where to find it. Uh, so it makes sense that when we moved the plant-based meat to be next to the regular meat, we saw a, a huge sales increase. It really was from new shoppers to the category. So people who either hadn't tried the plant-based meat before or hadn't purchased it at Kroger, you know, maybe they thought Kroger didn't carry items like that uh, and that they had to make a trip to a natural food store to get those but it also caused shoppers to purchase greater variety. So through doing this, we were able to add some variety and exposing customers to kind of these new flavors, new options, definitely resulted in an in increased sales and increased trial, which is great to see. Um, now, even though we had great test results, there's still the issue of there's only so much space at the store and on the shelf particularly in refrigerated sections, space is definitely at a premium. So they can, our strategy continues to evolve and it will look a little different in each store uh, depending on the, the customer base. But uh, it's nice to see that plant-based items are you know, part of the conversation instead of kind of being relegated off to a special section. They're just competing for shelf space in the category, just like every other item. So as long as that's what customers are looking for, you will see it show up uh, more and more on the shelf at the store. And then there's also e-commerce, which is you know, my focus area in my day job. And it um, can be even more difficult to discover new items online. One way of combating that is uh, through some of these specialty storefronts that, that a lot of retailers have, including Kroger. This is an example of of Kroger's plant-based uh, section on our website. So here we have education, we have kind of tips to get started or just defining what a plant-based diet is, uh, just if you're really brand new to this lifestyle, and then it gets into products. So this can be kind of a one-stop shop for customers who are new to this or just looking for new items. So maybe you've eaten a plant-based diet for a while, but you wanna kind of see what's the latest and greatest, uh, you know, burger or milk substitute that I can get. Um, so this is a great way to merchandise for the customers that find it. So one of the challenges with this special storefront is it's not a highly trafficked part of our site. Um, Grocery shopping online tends to be more of a mission. You're not really browsing generally. You have your list and you know exactly what you need. You're typing in the search bar and you're adding things to your cart. Generally not kind of perusing the site the way you would maybe with like an apparel retailer or a home goods retailer. So that's one of the challenges uh, for us is how do we help customers 
discover new items online. It's much easier to, to discover in store. And I think it's a, an ongoing challenge for e-commerce. Um, I don't know that anyone has quite cracked it uh, out there, but we are always testing out new ways of uh, bringing new items to the forefront online because we know that that's what customers are looking for. And then finally talking about the um, pricing of plant-based products. So obviously in the past, this really has been a premium category. I think there's probably an argument that some of that was driven by ingredient prices or the specialty nature of it. So if you're not, if it's not being made by a, a large producer or you're not producing it in bulk um, in huge quantities, it's going to be more expensive. But I also think that some of it has to do with the premium customer. So knowing that uh, this is a, not a price sensitive customer or hasn't been traditionally, you know, we can get away with um, having a more premium price on the item. But I'm excited to see that in the last year or two, the uh, companies have really had the goal of getting to price parity with uh, their conventional counterparts. Um, it's you know mission driven in a lot of cases, but also you know it's a capitalist goal as well to to sell more plant-based burgers. So um, as a retailer, as I mentioned earlier, we're also in the game of uh, achieving price parity through some of our private label products. So we want the, this category to be accessible to everyone. Um, we don't want it to be just for specialty or premium buyers. We want anyone who's interested to, you know, to have an option when it comes to plant-based, if they wanna try out the trend, Simple Truth is a great way to do it. Um, but then we're also excited to see, you know, more competitive pricing coming across the board as the popularity increases. I have a feeling that it will continue in that direction and um, it'll become you know, more competitive, which is, is good for customers um, and uh, ultimately good for, for retailers as well. And that is all that I had for my um, prepared content today, but happy to take any questions as well that anyone might have. Thank you so much for that, Anne. Um, very insightful, exciting presentation there. I might momentarily. Now I am. Hello, everyone. Um, let me um, ask some of the questions around, and there's obviously a lot in, in, in uh, the Q and A already, and I'm sure people will ask more questions. But what do you see as one of being one of the biggest or the two biggest obstacles? I guess from your position, one would be on the e-commerce side, right? Like, what could and can be done, and how can people be more incentivized about it? And you see, do, during our very early part of the conference. Um, so I was just, that, that should be better now. I think my mic was yes. upside down, sorry. Um, during the very early part of the, the conference, um, we obviously saw that most people are flexitarians, right? We're trying to cut back to some extent, but um, it is the majority of people eating plant-based are people that also eat meat. How do you get those to kind of try new things online when, you know, as you said, like, you know, beef burger or, you know, steak? Um, what do you do? Is that just about then doing the branding and marketing different, having them like pop up some of the, the plant-based items or what, what is it you do around that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it definitely is something that uh, our, our data analytics firm and pers personalization efforts can actually help with. There are ways that we can model customers to understand who would be more likely to try a plant-based item. So perhaps we can tell from your purchases that you're interested in health and wellness, but maybe you're not all the way there. So, you know, every once in a while you buy kind of a plant-based version or a healthier version of something, but then maybe you slip back to, to beef burgers because that's what you're used to. Um, we can actually use some of our personalization science to um, present the plant-based versions to the right customers. Um, it's something that we haven't necessarily focused on, um, the best way for us to do that would be in partnership with specific suppliers uh, because they're, uh, you know, obviously real estate is uh, very competitive on the site, uh, but it's something that I think I could see happening uh, very soon and, and being successful. Okay, and then if we look at more at the retailer as a whole, what do you think are, are the bottlenecks? Is it supply, is it shelf space, is it pricing, um, mm -hmm. all of the above? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like always, it's all of the above. But I, I really think shelf space is is very challenging. I mean, there are so many new product launches every year, and you know, many of them are not going to be successful. But uh, the the plant based items really have to compete with all of the conventional items, and um, the the awareness has to be there from a customer perspective. So, how do you pick? How does Kroger pick? You just you've just said you know there's so many new um, um, items coming up that you know not a day goes by almost without there being a, a new startup yeah. somewhere. But how how do you make sure you give them kind of the space they deserve and the chance they should have versus, mm-hmm. well, we also need to think about as a as being a business right and and turning profit for shareholders. How do you make those decisions? Yeah, and it's a great question because it's definitely a mix of art and science. Um, so I've always thought of merchandising as a, an art. Uh, there's a certain, we have a great team of category managers and there's a certain instinct that people tend to have when you're in the business about whether a product will connect with our customers. But there is also science involved, again, with our analytics firm, we can actually um, try and determine which need state, which customer need state a new product will fall into. And then we can understand, is that a need state that we already cover? Is that just, you know, the fifth version of plain yogurt that meets the same need? Or is this truly a new category, a new need state that, you know, is going to be incremental? It's all about incrementality. Um, So anything new that we bring in, you know, we want to increase the business, obviously, and be incremental. Um, So I think a blend of those two things, really the instinct of the, the expert category managers, along with some of the analysis that we're able to do makes the decisions easier, but it's still not a perfect, perfect science. And then how much at this point do you already look at um, sustainability? We've looked at it obviously throughout today already, kind of in terms of, you know, Chinese products is one thing, you know, in no way are there better words, but they have shipped across the world, world back and forth compared to um, US products um, on a global perspective. And then link to that um there has a lot of additives right if you again we we've done a, a white paper on this and looked at if you look at a beef burger you've got mincemeat you've maybe got some salt and some pepper and that's it but if you look at plant-based you're looking at about 20 22 ingredients so um how do you look at that do you actually see actually yes we've got this product already but you're using half as many ingredients um but then does it work right that's the other question i think there's a reason why there are so many ingredients to get that taste and to get the flavor mm-hmm. How does that play a part for you? Yeah, it's interesting because really we follow the customer's lead when it comes to their desires for these products. So um, I do think there's a nascent trend around limited ingredients and, you know, an ingredient list I can understand, nothing kind of weird, not, not so many chemicals. I do think that that there's a group of customers out there um, that, that that is a top priority for. I don't think it's the majority of customers yet. Mm -hmm. So I I think it will be even more important uh, in the future as the market matures. Um, But I think for the typical consumer, they're kind of glancing at, you know, if they're looking at anything, it's more of a nutrition label focus and, you know, Mm -hmm. calories, saturated fat. My doctor told me to cut back on cholesterol, all that kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I definitely think it's, it should be a priority going forward to have understandable ingredients, kind of a clean label, limited but then it still has to taste great and be a great price so you have to do yeah, everything i know yeah um, i've actually we've just received a very good question that's linked to that uh, one i hadn't thought about it from that angle yet is um around organic consumers and because mm-hmm. a lot of the products aren't actually organic so yeah do you see data do you see anything from, from in store about what organic you know consumers shop do they actually stay away from plant-based or does it tick the box because it is still better than killing an animal almost, so to speak? So have you got data on that? Um, you know, I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, my assumption, though, would be that a lot of those shoppers, if, they're, if that is truly a value that's important to them, they're probably also the people who are making their own veggie burgers. <laughs> You know, I, I would guess that a lot of these processed plant-based items, well, I know that they mostly appeal to flexitarians in mm. consumers, I think in part because of the processed nature. So for a lot of vegans, these are like occasional treat items versus kind of day in, day out, your main diet. Uh, so I think they actually more appeal to the mainstream shopper and a hardcore organic 
fan is is probably going to buy the beans and the and the mushrooms and mix it up themselves yeah that makes sense and um, we've got another question um on on you talked about private label and branded products where do you perceive higher growth i think you were kind of alluding towards the the private label side is that kind of because there's also um on a shareholder return perspective there's, there's more more profit in that for or is that are the products better or what do you see on that front um well like i said it's all about what the customers want so we absolutely will not carry a private label product that nobody buys mm. <laughs> Is, is way too valuable. Um, and ultimately the category manager just makes that decision regardless. It's a financial decision often, regardless of whether it's private label. But obviously the private label products are designed to have a margin edge. So if it's neck and neck, uh, the, the private label is going to have a slight edge for most retailers. Otherwise, you know, why are you why are you doing it if there isn't a margin advantage there? Um, but yeah, ultimately the customer decides. Okay. Perfect. Um, I think one of the last questions before um, we've got to move on, unfortunately, is, um, and I think it's a question I've asked many people tonight, um, or this morning, depending which time zone we're in. When do you think the flipping point could happen? And when do you think we could get to a point where we're closer to a 50-50 or starting to get more towards plant-based than meat? And how far mm. away do you think is that? Oh, I hope it's soon. I, you know, <laughs> so for me personally, I I'm a big advocate. Um, I do think that price parity is critical and then great taste. I think the day when um, you can buy an impossible burger or the cheapest cut of ground beef and they're exactly the same price is going to really launch things into the future um, because a lot of customers are limited in their budget. Could you compare those two though? I mean, they're like if you, if you actually go impossible burger or beyond meat, which obviously at, at the top end of the price curve versus mm -hmm. the cheapest cut is that what you want the, the margin to be would you want it to be like your i don't know your very good kobe beef burger premium, almost, yeah. Yeah, your premium. i mean from from the retailer perspective if we sell more of them <laughs> that's cool <laughs> uh but you're right that we all have to sort of uh, the, the suppliers can lower the, the cost the retailer also ultimately has to lower the price but if if there's a com competitive nature happening, um, the prices will continue to go down and that's generally how it works, as we know. Um, and that's where I think it needs to be for any sort of like flipping, approaching mm. or flipping. I think price has to be off the table for, for customers. Perfect, Bye. okay. And thank you very much. Um, I hope you can yeah, stay around. We've you. got, um, uh, to all of you, we've got some interesting sessions coming and we're looking into really that um, the costing between a beef burger and a plant-based burger, I think in, in 30 minutes from now. So again, that could be something interesting to watch and get all of your opinions on as well. And thank you very much on that front. Thank you. Um, and all of the questions have not been answered at this point and we will try to get back to you afterwards as, as previously mentioned. Um, that brings me on to our next session. We are completely going to change, um, not gear, but topic. And um, we are looking at risk management now. Now, see, we're looking at an area um, on, on the agricultural side where we've seen it in, in soya, for example, already on the wheat side, there's, um, there's risk management um, opportunities out there, but plant-based itself, the protein side, that, that derivative of, of these aforementioned products. So I'm very pleased today to um, announce quite a, well, a high profile lineup here. We've got um, Alison Coughlin, who's the director of research and product development at the CME Group. Um, we've got Jeffrey Koipus, also for CME Group, who's the executive director. And then we've got with us Rat Munoz, who's vice president of trading at Stonex Financial. Um, hello, everyone. Very good to see you. I'm just going to wait a second until you've all appeared next to me on screen. Um, 